Now, before we cover looping through lists of items, we have to get a little more intimate with understanding how do we play with lists. And there's really two properties that are pretty important for lists. So let's go back to our inventory example, where we have a sword and a cow plushie and a cup of coffee. I'm drinking coffee right now. Deca. And there's two interesting things about this inventory I want to show you. So we've talked about how, although we didn't add keys or they look like just keys, they're actually just values, right? And they're separated by commas and it could be any data type. Lua will automatically kind of put keys there for you. So if you look how it's printed out, again, Lua arrays or Lua lists their table version of it is one base. So that means if we want to access just the first item in the list, we use the property or the dynamic property access. Normally you would say like things like name or conscious or health or something like that if you want to dynamically access it via a string rather than a dot syntax such as like this. But in an array or list, you access item keys using a number. So that would be the first item, which would be sword, right? We print it out, pretty cool. And the last item, which would be the third item, because one, two, three, would be the cup of coffee.com. Right there. Fantastic. So that's how you access items in the array using numerical indices. Now, for loops, they're going to want to know how long is this ar array or how long is this list? How long should I be looping? You can use this pound symbol or hash in front of the variable, and it'll give you the length of that list. So when we print it out, you'll see that it's three, and that's fantastic. Now, one caveat to this is nil. Now, if we add nil in there, this is considered a bad practice in Lua because Lua uses kind of nil to imply that the array is done. So if we print out the length again, it's going to show the length is three, even though we added nil in there. Now, you're allowed to mix and match data types, but nil is special. So watch what happens if I were to access, let's say, inventory four. Now, you and I both know there is no inventory four. There's only three items, but it's going to print out nil. That means there's nothing at index four. It's not like Python where it's going to yell at you. It's very similar to JavaScript. It's like, well, there's nothing there, bro. You know what happens when I put nil at four, right? If I intentionally put nil there, it still says nil, which makes sense. But watch what happens when we go back to printing the length of the inventory. And we saw it was three before. We have a nil. So it looks like there's four items, but it actually prints out three. Now I'm going to add a sword, let's do a shield, shield at the end of this. And now there's five items, one, two, three, four, five. And this is nil. When I print it out, it's going to show five, right? Because again, it gets confused if there's a nil, it seems that's the end of the array. And they've done their best to kind of guesstimate. Well, it looks like there's actually five items. So we'll go ahead and include this. So very disparate results. So this is kind of why it's a bad practice to put nil in your array, it's better to treat it like empty or nothing or some kind of whatever you consider, you know, that that's not the nil keyword, because this is going to matter when you are querying for length of lists and trying to figure out how long they are for for loops. So that's the basics of accessing items in a list and querying their length and how nil kind of is considered a bad practice to use nil inside those.